morning, everybody. On behalf of the New York Times, uh, a very warm welcome to the, to the Climate Hub. Uh, over the next few days, the, this Climate Hub is going to be home to business leaders, policymakers, innovators, and, and scientists, all working together with the, the wider community here in Glasgow to debate, to discuss, uh, and discover actionable climate solutions together. Now, before this uh, session kicks off, and I hand over to my colleague, David Gelles, to, to lead today's discussion, uh, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Leaps by Bayer, for hosting this session. And, uh, and thank you also to our audiences, both here in Glasgow, but also to those tuning in from around the world. Um, and as a reminder, if you are joining virtually, uh, to submit your questions to the broadcast. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be part of this gathering of brilliant activists, scientists, journalists, and citizens, all united by a common goal to fight climate change. I'm grateful to the New York Times for bringing us together in Glasgow and virtually. And I'm very much looking forward to this discussion with innovators who are exploring different ways to meet the global demand for protein. Developing a sustainable protein supply is one of 10 huge challenges or leaps that we aim to address at Leaps by Bayer, our company's impact investment unit. It's also at the heart of our recent investment into Fork and Good, a company developing breakthrough technology to grow cultured meat at scale. I hope you have a chance to learn more about them here at the Climate Hub. Worldwide demand for meat is expected to grow by 70% in the next 30 years. And after fossil fuel, livestock farming is the largest single industry driver of climate change. To solve this, we need a range of transformative solutions to nourish people without starving the planet. Thanks again to all, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. There we go. All right, some people are awake. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, and to be here in the room of the trees. Uh, it's really an extraordinary space that, that our team and uh, as Devlin have put together. Uh, and you can actually smell the difference in the air here. Uh, so it's, it's a delight. We're here this morning to talk about the meat of the matter, if you will. So much focus, rightly so, this week is uh, squarely on energy production. But of course, as we just heard, uh, an, an almost equally important challenge, perhaps, as we think about a net zero future, is really transforming agriculture, livestock, and more. And so just before I introduce the panel, just and I invite my panel to participate here, uh, how many people had breakfast before they came? I certainly did. Yeah? How many people ate meat at breakfast? Anyone? Yeah? A few people did, of course, but not as many as perhaps uh, I would imagine. How many people had a purely vegan breakfast, perhaps? Uh, several. That's great. Well, the transformation is underway, and no surprise, <laughs> it's happening here. Uh, I'm joined today uh, by Maggie. Rishani, the founder and CEO of Nobel Foods, a company that's making dairy products, or dairy substitutes, I should say, from plants. We also, to her right, have Alain Riva, the chief marketing and strategy officer at Insect, which is a company that is making uh, proteins from insects. And we've got Chris Elliott, currently a professor of food safety and the founder of the Institute for Global Food Security at the Queen's University in Belfast. Thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, Maggie, I wonder if you could help us just by picking up on what we heard just a bit of in this video and help us get our heads around the scale of the problem. Uh, again, we know that the energy transition needs to happen, rightly so, but how important is the transformation of the agriculture, the food sector, and particularly plant proteins to the overall push for sustainability and a net zero future? Yep, um, that is a great question. and. I want to just start by saying that we're not going to address the climate crisis without addressing the food system. Like the food system is a third of all greenhouse gas emissions. It's a huge problem. 
And really at the core of that number, half of those emissions come from the fact that we raise animals for food. So in order to really come up with solutions and dig ourselves out of this crisis, we need to address food. And I think to do that, we're gonna have to look into a lot of innovations, new technologies, new solutions, and we're gonna need a lot of different people, different scientists, storytellers, we want everyone to come together and work on this problem. Uh, it is, I would say, it is really still underrepresented. Even at this conference that's all about you know, climate, we see less talk about food, uh, and we need to put it back on the agenda in a more meaningful way. I think everybody associates fossil fuel with climate change. Mm -hmm. Most people, or not all people, do that with, with the food system. Yeah. It's interesting, yesterday was finance day here at COP, and, and several people remarked, and in certain my experience as well, that they had never seen finance on the agenda in, in quite such a forceful way at, at a COP. And I do wonder if when we think uh, two and five and six years out in, in these kind of gatherings ahead, if food is going to take a, a more central seat at the table, if you will. Uh, Elaine, I want your thoughts on, on what Maggie just said, because she said, uh, at a certain level, we need to stop producing, using animals to produce so much protein. That sort of strikes right at the very heart of your business model, though. That's exactly what Insect is doing. Is this an either-or situation in your mind, or are there, are, are, are there gradations of um, more sustainable, less sustainable uses of animals to create protein? Thank you. Thank you, uh, David, for, uh, for having me. Um, obviously, the... the, the um, you can't, you know, posit the um, the problem in a way of, you know, all vegan versus, you know, all meat. You know, it's it's, it's definitely going to be somewhere in the middle. Uh, ra radicalism is not um, helping, um, and so it's uh, perfection is the enemy of the good. I think the 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 issue here is we need to produce more sustainably, um, and obviously there are some very unsustain unsustainable production methods. Um, it takes you know, eight kilo of feed to get one kilo of beef. That's unsustainable. Insects will do anywhere between one and two. So basically, it's the most sustainable protein um, production in the world. Uh, but at the same time, you also need quality. And I think this is you know, something healthy for you. Um, and um, you know, by that same token, obviously, um, you know, quality means you know, no ultra-processed you know, ingredients, or as little as possible. Um, so that eliminates a lot of plant-based foods. So it's basically somewhere in the middle, right? It just, you need to just be there and produce more sustainably, and then you need to produce uh, more healthy food. Um, and it's also a quantity issue. We need 70% more food uh, by 2050. So if we start to bicker on, you know, should we do this, should we do that, we're just gonna miss on the fact that there's gonna be 9.7 billion people on this planet, and they all need to eat. Yeah. Chris, you, uh, think a lot about food security and, and the integrity of the global food system. When you, when you e hear some of the stats that we've been introduced to just in the last few minutes, when you think about uh, dairy substitutes being derived from plants and protein substitutes being derived from insects, do you have any concerns, perhaps, about the unintended consequences that we might not even fully understand about what such a radical transformation of our food system in such a short amount of time might bring. Yeah. So thank you. I think in terms of it's important to contextualize things. I mean, you know, we're here to talk about planetary health, unbelievably important. The food system has to transition, absolutely. But we can't forget about us, <laughs> the human population. We're sitting at about 8 billion people at the moment in my lifetime. The population of the human planet has more than doubled. During this session, there'll be 6,000 more mouths to feed. So we can't forget about that. And also, where we sit at the moment, we have about 1 billion people on the planet who suffer from malnutrition due to a lack of calories. We have 2 billion people who suffer from malnutrition due to too many empty calories. And we have 2 billion people who suffer from malnutrition due to hidden hunger. And that's a lack of micronutrients in our diet. So any transitions in the food system has to take that into account as well. We can't make that burden on human health worse. So that transitioning is going to be unbelievably complicated and there's going to have to be multiple changes. And you know, I'm not here to kind of support the livestock industry. It has to change as well. And there's a huge amount of activity going on in that, in that arena already. Yeah, okay. I, I wanna come back to several points you made, but first I wanna give 
Maggie a chance to respond to the, the ch uh, Alain used the word radical, and I don't know if Maddie, Maggie is a, a radical. Maggie, are you, are you personally a vegan? Yes, I am. Do you think everyone should be a vegan? I don't think that that's an option for many people. Okay. Because it's, you know, I do think, I do it because I believe that in the, it, it's aligned with my values, mm -hmm. and I do it because I believe that, and honestly, if I didn't believe so deeply in it, I wouldn't even have started this company. Right. Uh, but if you think about what our company does, we are making dairy proteins in plants to make products that taste and function just like dairy from an animal. Because I know for a fact that most people, it's really hard to change their diet, right? right? So if it was that easy, we wouldn't even be in the, the situation we're in today. Everyone would have already been vegan or vegetarian, but we're not. And why focus on dairy? I think when a lot of people think about the, the most urgent need for change in the food system, the first thing they think about is beef. W why dairy? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And I think that we should be thinking of dairy and beef. They're both extremely unsustainable. Uh, so if you think of dairy, and we're focused on cheese in particular. Cheese mm -hmm. is one of the highest offenders when it comes to carbon footprint. It's the third highest emitter after beef and lamb. Mm. Uh, dairy cows, you need to feed a cow six kilograms of plant protein to make one kilogram of dairy protein. It takes 600 liters of water to make one liter of milk. And dairy cows are two to three percent of all emissions. So they are a big part of the problem. I think it's great that we're talking about the food system to start and then talking about beef, but also I think dairy is a big part of the problem and it can be a big part of the solution. Okay, okay, I wanna come back to several things you said as well, but first I wanna hear from Alan, when you think about sort of this replacement, a, a transition away from uh, what to insects? You know, I, I, insect, just to put the, to, just to be as blunt as possible, he's, he, he described to me factories with rows and rows of tubs of insects, with robots going around and picking them up and moving them along. And this is the future of the food industry? W what is this replacing? Well, I mean, is this replacing, you know, like oats? Because I might want my oatmeal. No, no absolutely. Um, I think the, the, you know, the urgency of, of climate change and of food insecurity, um, you know, requires a radical response. Not, you know, radical opinions, but radical response. Um, and, and that basically means a completely new way of producing with 98% less land, 50% less resources, because we only have 5% extra arable land available. So it's not a question of, you know, what, what is it going to look like? It's going to look like the future. It's going to be highly technological. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have filed 300 patents. So it's going to be very, something very, very different than what people expect. Um, but the key question is more, how are we going to feed 9.7 billion people, address all the issues that Chris mentioned, um, and how are we going to actually tell people it's okay to be vegan and vegetarian? We actually make, 50% of our production is um, an agriculture organic fertilizer, so we actually just push very, very, very heavily into this area as well. Um, and 50% of what we produce is, is animal protein, except very, very sustainable animal protein at scale, so we address animal nutrition markets like aquaculture, poultry pigs, um, et cetera, et cetera, which have insects in their diet. You know, so originally, you know, we are reinventing, you know, quote unquote, the food chain by feeding these animals like, you know, salmon and shrimps and, you know, poultry and pigs, what they used to eat in, in, in the wild. Um, and we also address human nutrition um, and human health. We have, you know, claims of 60% reduction of cholesterol or 35% reduction of, of fat in, in people's diets. And so th this, is, this is a global, you know, change, you know, revolution in the, uh, in the, in the food system that we need to address, um, you know, because the urgency is, is there. Yeah. Chris, can, can you speak more specifically about some of your concerns about human health? Again, someone used the term ultra-processed uh, alternatives or ultra processed ingredients. ingredients. And I, I wonder, as, as a former cattle farmer yourself, someone who knows the, the way that cattle have historically been raised in sort of the most purest bucolic form, when you think about fake meat, if you will, I know the fake meat uh, industry doesn't like that term, but that's what a lot of people call it, whether or not they like it. Do you have concerns about what's in there? I mean, when, if I go to a fast food restaurant and order a, uh, a, an artificial meat burger, are you worried about what's inside? Do we know fully what's inside? Well, it, it is 
unbelievably big business. <clears throat> the amount of investment that has gone into alternative proteins is huge. And I wonder <clears throat> if you sat and look at the business plans, are those business plans about saving the planet or about making huge amounts of money? <clears throat> and I, I, I actually think it's the latter because it's about profit margins. A lot of the driving of this is profit margins. I mean, I've looked at the ingredients of many of these substitute meats, and they're horrendous, to be honest with you. I mean, I have no idea what their environmental footprint is like, but their nutritional footprint is atrocious. You know, there could be 40 or 50 different chemicals put into that. Most of it is soya-based or bean protein-based, and then there's you know, glues and gums are added to stick the thing together. I don't think that's the future of our global food system. I mean, that's Frankenstein food to me. Maggie, your yeah. response. I, I know, I, 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 respond to that directly, and then we can have a conversation about the semantics, about whether or not we should be calling it fake meat. But when you hear what the way Chris just described, plant-based alternatives to traditional animal proteins, if that's an okay way to phrase it, what's your response? I mean, obviously I disagree. <laughs> um, I think we have to think about what is it replacing, right? If you are going to eat a burger and your patty is replacing a beef burger or if you're getting a chicken nugget and your plant proteins are replacing God knows what's in a chicken nugget today, then it is not bad. It's not, wor it's not worse than what you're getting. And actually, I think it's better. I would go to say it's better because you're not getting some of the things in there like the cholesterol with dairy substitutes, as you call them, you're not getting in their um, you know, hormones and cholesterol. There's a lot of benefits that come from that. And we should not judge food by the list of ingredients that's in there. If you get a smoothie that has 10 fruits in it, does that mean it's unhealthy? No, I think it's very kind of myopic to just look at the number of ingredients and judge it by that. Uh, I think we're really missing the point here when we focus on the list of ingredients and how long it is versus what is that food replacing, how are people eating it, and all the other benefits that come from it, whether it's the environmental footprint or all the other issues associated with how we're making food today. Um, so really, I don't think that's a valid point, and it's not fair to talk about it that way. And I'm not, I'm not going to talk about how we call things, but it's really important to address that, so I hope we, we get to that. We should have that conversation. I think it's, yeah. it's absolutely uh, it's worthwhile. But first, I, 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 I wants to jump in no, here. No, I, what I wanted to say was ultra-processed ingredients. You know, it's something different than a, a very long list of, of, of ingredients. Ultra-processed ingredients are just bad for human health. So the issue is, if you replace something, you know, saving the planet and being very, very helpful, but you actually are harming um, human beings, that's not the solution. That's why what I was saying earlier was flexitarian is the way to go. Everybody should be able to be a vegan, a vegetarian, you know, and, and have some meat in their diet, maybe less than they, than they, than they used to, but, but basically have a varied, um, you know, um, diet. And, and, but it, it should be, you know, as a focus on sustainability and, and good for the planet, but also good for human beings. And so, you know, I mean, I'm, I'll give you an example because we have some, some human, uh, you know, food uh, products. Um, we basically have maybe two, three, four, you know, ingredients, and we limit, you know, the ultra-processed ingredients to zero um, if we can. And I think that's, you know, some, some sort of a, of a goal. So there's maybe one step and then another step, but it's, uh, it shouldn't be, you know, saving the planet at the expense of human health. And I don't think that's happening, to be honest. I don't think that's happening because what you're replacing right now with the plant proteins that are coming on board are burgers and chicken nuggets and pizza cheese. Um, and I, if your idea of being healthy is eating pizza, then we have a different conversation to have, right? So, Chris, it, you essentially accused um, uh, alternative uh, protein companies of being in it for the money. I, I, I know as a business reporter that there are plenty of uh, conventional agricultural companies, uh, fast food companies, major uh, meat and dairy producers, conventional ones, that are also in it for the money. D when you said earlier that you acknowledged that the conventional beef system needs to change, what do you have in mind? What is a healthy, sustainable future of the conventional meat industry look like in your mind? And I, I really think the livestock industry, not just meat, but meat and dairy, has to change. I mean, I'm total agreement with that. So I think the way that, particularly in the US, that, that cattle are raised is horrendous, to be honest with you. The, yep. the feedlot base, the animals never get outside. 
But there, there are so many examples of good practice using what's called regenerative agriculture now. There's a wonderful article in the New York Times, there's your plug, about how the prairies are being regenerated at the moment. And that's conservation groups working together with cattle ranchers to, to bring back the health to the soil and, and you know, pasture-fed animals. You know, I come from Ireland. All of our animals are fed in grass. And the reason for that is we can't actually grow anything else. Only grass will grow there because of the climate. Mm. So if suddenly we say, stop growing beef in Ireland, what happens? We're, we're not going to start to grow pineapples there. <laughs> okay, point taken. But you acknowledge over and over that we do have this massive global food system. So when you say feedlots need to go away, what does an alternative look like that still provides uh, large quantities of livestock for a growing human population? Or are you of the opinion that, in fact, uh, on balance, the human consumption of meat needs to be radically reduced? Because either we, we continue to have factory farms that can produce livestock at the scale, or people start eating a lot less meat. Yeah. Again, <clears throat> contextualize that. What's the biggest polluter on the planet in terms of our food system? What uses the most water? What produces the most greenhouse gases? Anybody know? It's rice. So are we going to say, let's stop producing rice because it's bad for the planet? Well, we're not, because it feeds 2.5 billion people. That's their staple diet. And I, I think we've got to say the same thing about meat production. We're not going to say we're going to suddenly re remove it and re replace it, because that will kill our ecosystem as well. Livestock is in a hugely important part of our whole ecosystem. Now, and there, there was great discussions about hyper-processed food. Most hyper-processed food comes from plants. It's vegetable oils, it's corn starch, but meat as well. And that's what I want to cut out of the diet, the hyper-processed foods that are going into our diet that constitutes the, the, the unhealthy lifestyle that yeah. so many people have. Yeah. I mean, th this starts to get into a conversation that we're probably not going to have up here on stage, which gets back to cooking and, and dietary habits. And that's a much broader conversation that we would have to have another time. I want to briefly remind uh, our viewers online, we have a large online audience today, uh, that they can submit questions and we'll try to get to them in probably about 10 minutes or so. Also to the audience here, please uh, think of some questions. We, I'm going to chat with our panelists for a bit more, but we want to open it up and have a lively discussion today. Um, Maggie. When you modify plant protein and create uh, uh, alternatives to traditional dairy products, are you modifying the genetics of plants? Yeah, before I address that, can I just say one thing? Yes. <laughs> uh, I think the question that you brought up, David, earlier is really important, is that the demand, the appetite for animal protein is not going away. Right? Okay, and, and, agreed. And we need to figure out how to feed people without completely destroying the planet. And I have no idea how regenerative agriculture alone is going to do that. I have literally, there's no way to do that. You're going to need another planet and a half to do that. So I think that it's great that we acknowledge a problem, but we also need to acknowledge that we need to invest in a lot more solutions and we need to think outside of the box and we need more technologies. So going back to your question about what we're doing, uh, yes, we engineer plants to make dairy proteins. You can actually engineer the plant to make any protein you want. We spend, we have a team of about you know, 30, 40 scientists and we've spent the last five years figuring out how to make dairy proteins in plants. And again, the reason for that is because dairy proteins are so functional and make dairy dairy in terms of the taste and the functionality. And if you wanna give people that experience, no one, like dairy that doesn't come from an animal, meat that does not come from an animal is 1% of the food right now. It, it's really a tiny, tiny fraction, right? I know that it sounds like it's such a big deal because we talk about it, um, but, and, and there's investment going in the space, but it's still a tiny fraction of the food system. And no one is gonna change by just ask, asking people to buy things that don't taste good to them, right? Right. So dairy proteins give you the taste, the functionality, and that's what we do. That's why we produce them in a plant system instead of an animal system. Given the growing concerns about GMOs, especially here in Europe, how do you then think about the balance between, again, these concerns about food safety, concerns about GMOs, and the, the, you know, the mission that you have to create a, a less carbon-intensive food system? Yeah, so genetic engineering is 
a wonderful tool and we need to use it and every tool we have to dig ourselves out of this crisis. There is nothing inherently unsafe about using genetic engineering and actually I would argue that it's irresponsible for us to not use it given the problems we have. Uh, so, you know, unfortunately there's countries that have laws that are not based on science and facts and that's fine but we're looking to we're looking to sell in the US which is a country that does not have these issues with the regulatory right right I mean and I, that's a separate conversation about the you know the future yep. where, where you think the the market could go but what a provocative statement that it's irresponsible not to use GMOs to address the climate crisis let's let's keep thinking about that all right no no and I, and what Maggie said made me think of you know our, our company was started by environmental activists and scientists. And what they discovered essentially was that you could use nature, completely organic, completely natural, not modified, not genetically modified, not engineered, not re-engineered, um, no synth bio, and just basically take what nature has, you know, it has always given, you know, uh, to, this, to this planet and, and basically use it to our advantage. So insects were, you know, a pest, you know, something that you needed to get rid of. Um, but two billion people on this planet are eating them on a daily basis. Um, you know, Mexico is the highest consum consum consumer per capita uh, of insects, and um, and so that's that's how it started. So I think there are lots of very natural, very organic, um, you know, alternatives to actually solving the food system. Obviously, it's not going to be the solution, but one of the solution. Yeah. Chris, when you think about global diets. I think a lot of focus, uh, certainly here, given the attendees and our location, certainly given the New York Times, we're based in the United States, most of our coverage is focused on the United States. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a perspective that largely looks at the global west and the global north. When, when, can you help us put this conversation a, a, and frame it up for the rest of the world that, that doesn't have as many startups pursuing alternatives? that doesn't have um, you know, fast food uh, restaurants on every corner. When we think about the global south, the developing world, how can they meet their, uh, not only their uh, protein needs in the years ahead, but also the needs of an emerging middle class and their preferences? What does a sustainable future look like for them if meat and livestock is a big part of that equation? We're sitting here in this beautiful venue uh, in the developed world <clears throat> talking about changing the food system. And you know, there are tens of millions of smallholders that that's their livelihood. They depend on harvesting a crop, selling that crop, and keep them, keeping their family. Yeah. So we have to be really careful that we're not pontificating about making all of these changes and not thinking about the impact that it will have on those tens of millions of people. You know, there's one million pepper farmers in Vietnam. <laughs> you know, that, that's all that they, they do. So we've got to be so careful about saying we're going to do this and do that and not thinking about contextualizing things, okay? So I think in terms of, you know, in the developing world, there's a, there is a growing demand for animal-based protein. And we're going to say, no, actually, you can't do that because it's right. being harmful for the planet. We are being so arrogant, I tell you, so arrogant. We have to think about the global food supply system. We've got to think about good nutrition and doing all of it in a sustainable way. Yeah. Maggie, your, your focus, your, you just said, it was squarely on the United States. I, I, is that really the place where you believe you can make the most impact right now? Given that, I mean, as you acknowledge, the, the market is relatively small, and a lot of the people who are uh, buying some of these substitutes are probably ones with a lot of discretionary income. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that we're only going to be in the United States. I'm saying we're starting with the okay. United States. But, um, I mean, I agree with everything Chris said. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely agree with that. I think that our technology, our solution in particular, is focused on industrialized animal agriculture, which is in the developing world. Mm -hmm. So if you look at where most of the emissions are coming from, you know, China, US are the top two, and they have some of the most industrialized food systems, and that's where our solution is. We're not trying to displace small farmers, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa, or that's not <laughs> what we're doing, and the focus is on industrialized animal agriculture. Yeah. 
Uh, Alain, when you think about the, the developing world, the global south, what are the potential applications for insect protein as we think about reforming uh, the food system from, from head to tail? Well, I mean, the, 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 the implications, but also the applications are, are, are many, obviously, are our technology and you know applies everywhere and 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 insects you know particularly in the developing world is um, is is very accepted and um, and so we could have units you know pretty much everywhere we could actually just work with farmers um, like we do now in, in in Europe you know to to produce our our, our protein so it's uh, it's something that's very adapted for the global south um, it's also some you know some of the easiest cheapest you know fastest you know best solution for the global south. To, um, to basically get the protein it needs in its, in its, in its diet um, and address you know, the, these, these food insecurity and, and, and climate change issues. Yeah. Chris, you raise your hand, please. Yeah. I just wanted to follow on from that. Do you know that 10% of all of our greenhouse gas emissions comes from food waste? <laughs> Wasted food, 10%. And can you imagine starting to convert a lot of that food waste into insect protein, which can go into animal feed, can go into human food consumption. Those are going to be the massive changes that we can bring about w without having to think about producing, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, substitute meats and substitute dairy products. Because you ask people <coughs> who was a vegan, well, I'm not a vegan, but I'm a flexitarian, and there's days of the week. I don't want to eat meat, but you know what? I don't rush out to a supermarket to buy some fake burger, to be honest with you. I just eat vegetables. And I just think we've really got to be so careful about some of these changes. And I think some of the work has been done on the insect proteins. That's going to have huge impact, positive impact on our climate. Mm. I mean, it, 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 no, I, just, I just wanted to add you know, one more thing on, onto what, what Chris was saying. Um, I think the, the alternative has to be somewhere in the middle. And it, and it just cannot be about, oh, I'm going to replace junk food with you know, junk food, but it's plant-based, so it's better for the planet, but it's still junk food. It has to be something that's healthy, but it also has to be something that's actually good for the planet. So the, the issue there is maybe the middle hasn't been found yet, but it will be um, very, very rapidly. I think plant-based, you know, food, and I've been eating plant-based food. You know, seitan, you know, wasn't so popular, you know, as a as a brand name back then, you know, for you know, over a decade, and 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 I love it. I think the issue is, it's just, it has to be something that's good for the planet and good for for human beings as well. Yeah, Can I disagree. I'm, please Can I disagree. disagree. Absolutely. Uh, so, I think that people right now are eating junk food, yeah. and. They're already doing it. They're not stopping. They're not going to stop. If they're eating junk food, I'd rather that that is more sustainable. And I think that we are not being ambitious enough. If is we're unsustainable. Not, it's I, What I'm saying is that people are eating it. I'd rather yeah. that it's it's more sustainable. More sustainable. Sorry. Got it. I no, misspoke. thank you. Yes. I, I'd rather that it's more sustainable. Yeah. You're going to do it anyway. Right? So let's not try to have the perfect solution that addresses every single problem People are already doing things. They're making these choices every day. Yeah, absolutely, we can do them better, but that's happening. You know what's not happening? The climate reduction is not happening in our food system. And we, it's not one solution. Yes, food waste is a problem. Let's address food waste. But also, there is a cow that is highly inefficient and that produces half of the methane that's on this planet. Why are we not addressing that? Why are we saying that we need to come up with other ways to make that very inefficient system that we have a little bit more inefficient. I think that's unambitious and we need to try harder because we don't have time. And again, as I mentioned, this is a sector that contributes to a third of the emissions on this planet. It's as much as the whole transportation system. It's as much as fossil fuels. Why are we tiptoeing around this? Why are we not treating this like an organic, natural? We need to be able to do everything because we're going to need every single solution that's, that we have access to. So. That's my two cents, I'm done. <laughs> Fantastic. We're about to go to questions, but I just want to take a moment and reflect that it, it, I've been having these conversations about the energy transition. And, and it strikes me that compared to the energy transition, uh, uh, this, this is really the hard stuff, right? Everyone would just be happy if we could have clean energy right away. But the debate, the, the visceral relationship we, we have with our food and the impacts on human health make it such a much more multifaceted issue. And the transition, I think, uh, for all the reasons we've just heard, is going to be that much more complex. 
Um, maybe we could start with a question from our virtual audience, and then we'll get to some folks in the audience. I can't hear you. Still can't hear you. All right, we'll go to the audience first. Who's got a question? Anyone in the live audience here? Yeah, in the back there, please. First, what, first person I see here. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah, thank you. So you've spoken a lot today about the impact of various foods on the climate and climate change, but I'd be interested to hear from all of you about your thoughts on actually how can climate change affect food? So how is food security at risk as our climate goes into decline? And does insect protein or plant-based protein production offer a more resilient option as we see temperatures rising and our, our natural environment change? Thank Terri you. Terrific question, and, and certainly poignant over the last year we've had. Chris, this is you're squarely in your wheelhouse. I mean, super question. I mean, climate is having a massive impact on our food systems. We get crop failures, you know, we, we, we monitor those, you get crop failures week in, week out. And what that is doing is there, there's, there's a drive in terms of, of infectious diseases in crops as well, particularly fungi. And then whenever you get the fungi affecting crops, what you have to do is to put more pesticides on the crops. So it, 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 we're in a very, very bad cycle at the moment. And you know, there was discussions about GM, and we've got GM, and we've got gene editing. Science and technology will have a huge role, a very positive role. Now, I'm not a great believer in using GM to, to turn soy protein into some sort of, you know, albumin. But, you know, GM is about protecting crops, getting resistant strains of disease, and GE is about increasing uh, the productivity of crops. So I, I think, you know, there, there's a whole subject area we could have a wonderful discussion about. Yeah. I mean, well, thank I you for that question. I mean, we, we, if we had more time, I think we should explore it in more depth. I, do we have a working mic for a virtual question? Uh, I think we do now. Great. Thanks, yeah. David. We have two questions from the virtual audience. How much of the responsibility for transforming food systems should sit with policymakers or big companies versus the consumer? And we also have a question about the role of subsidies in supporting the meat and dairy industry. What can we do to raise the profile of food systems transformation in climate policy? Okay, I would break that first question really into three questions. You know, where's policy, where's corporations, and where's the individual? I mean, my, my uh, experience, especially since Paris, is that, you know, policymakers can make a lot of promises and they don't always get lived up to. Um, I, I'd love to hear uh, uh, Maggie's thoughts specifically on the individual choice. Would you just take that one? Um, is this something that we need to put on the individuals? I think we all play a role. I think all of the above is the, the answer. Everyone should play a role. But as a consumer, you get to vote with your fork three times a day, mm. at least. <laughs> and I think we should use that vote wisely and vote for things that align with the future we want to build. So when given a chance, we have, I think at this point, the responsibility as well to make choices that really optimize for more sustainable food options. Okay, so yes to consumers. Uh, Elaine, I want you to take the corporation side. You're already partnering with other big corporations. They want insects. Is it on corporations? Do they need to be the ones driving this change? Well, okay, two things. First, on the first question, I want to say there's no doubt that controlled environment agriculture is one of the solutions to the issue of the effect of climate on food systems. The fact that you are controlling an environment that you're you know, using 98% less land and 50% 50, 50 less resources is actually a lot better. Uh, and you're not subject to the climate and its, and its you know, vagaries. Um, but on, on the corporations, I think you know, our company was started by environmental activists and scientists. And I think they started as a non-for-profit, trying to change you know, children's opinion on what they were eating, where it was coming from, what they were eating. And I think the impact you know, was, was great, but it wasn't as great as just doing what we're doing now. And so I think the, the, we're not waiting for you know, consumer to, to, to change. We're not waiting for policymakers 
to make the right policies. We are very lucky to have you know France lead you know this this movement. I think right. that's that's very uh, that's a very noble and, and very important cause, and 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 we get a lot of support from the from the government in, in that regard. But I think the the uh, you know entrepreneurs are basically taking the the issue um, into their hands and 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 trying to find the solutions, build the solutions you know to change this world. Okay, so yes to corporations as well, Chris, as briefly as you can. What's the role of a policy in in creating this a more sustainable future for the agriculture yeah. system? And, and it actually covers the second part of that question. Policy can be driven by taxation and subsidies. And generally those are driven by how many votes governments will win or lose. So it's generally very short termist. Yeah. And it is really up to the private sector and particularly, you know, startups to, to change the world. A lot of the big, large corporations, they are so slow to change. So, you know, we've got two different ways here and there's a multitude of startups and there will be winners and losers in that. So governments, you, you change the subsidies, you drive change. Absolutely. Anyone uh, from my home country in the U.S. knows about the farm bill and our, our corn subsidies. We've got a, a, a short-termist perspective, I would say. Who's got one provocative question to take us out in the audience? I saw some other hands up. In the front here, please. Someone have a mic for her, please? There we go. Hi. So it's a question from both of us. Great. Uh, we're activists from Brazil. Yeah, I'm Marina, she's Amalia, and here our home country, agribusiness plays a huge role in the economy and really in the um, unequal system of sustainability. And we are here to ask how to turn not only the agribusiness uh, system more um, sustainable, but also the daily life of the global south into a more healthy way. Yeah, because uh, you were talking a lot about uh, some cattle like production that is more sustainable. But in our country, we see virtually none of that. Mm. And we see more of big uh, landowners destroying our forests and, you know, contributing significantly to climate change. Absolutely. OK, thank you for being here and thank you for the question. Uh, Chris, very briefly, let's start with you. Phenomenal question, thank you for that. I'm actually doing quite a lot, lot of work on looking at soya coming out of, out of South America, particularly Brazil, and it is big business, but it also employs so many people. And until there's a, an alternative way to support those people, that will keep happening. And this is again where I think we have to look for the world to start to subsidize farming production in areas of the world which can change to a sustainable system because it'll have a massive impact on the whole planet. All right. I think, you know, in Brazil, you know, in particular, which is a country that we love, um, you know, it's a policy issue, much more than just, you know, a corporation issue. Um, you know, President Macron of France, you know, raised the issue of the Amazon rainforest. And, um, you know, the president of Brazil said, you know, this is a national, you know, issue of Brazil. And so, you know, you shouldn't be talking about this. So I think the, the issue there is, you know, how do you change policy? in Brazil uh, to address these, these, uh, these changes you know, on the ground. Maggie, the last word to you. I'm going to take a different approach and say that one way to be effective, I, I find it really hard, especially I'm from a country that, you know, originally that is not like the United States, it's more similar to Brazil. Um, and I think it's really hard to change politicians in those countries. So. My more practical answer to that is that if the demand is not there, they will not make it, right? So if the demand for cheap meat is not as prominent, then there are opportunities to reduce that production. Sorry, I don't have the perfect answer for you, but that's the best, the most practical thing I can think about. Well, I think what I just heard there is a combination of po policy solutions, of, of corporate solutions, and of individual choices which again just illustrates to me what a what a absolutely challenging issue this is again i think perhaps more so than the energy transition uh, I, this is a fantastic conversation to start the day many thanks to all our panelists thank you all for being here and to our audience online appreciate it thank you all thank you for having us yes.